listen up. <laughs> Here we go. So what does it mean to you 20 years early? Well, it was this February, 20 years of the score. Yeah. Yeah, I hit him up. I was like, yo, Reasonable Doubt wasn't the only great album that came out in that year. That was a know. crazy <laughs> year, man. Yeah, it was a crazy year. 96. Nah, but even 96. before we get that, can you sort of give like the sort of backdrop? Like the Fuji's wasn't this overnight success. Like this was the nah. turning point. Or he sort of bring up like what started the whole movement itself and led to the score. What yeah. was the mentality? Well, I think um, so. When we first started out, and and this is what people don't know. So before, I was like a struggling producer, right? So I was signed to Craig Kalman. I was signed to like wow. Big Beat Atlantic Records. Records. He's, yeah, Atlantic yeah, so, yeah, he's so a big boss at Atlantic now. For yeah, yeah, that's the big man. So the big man, <laughs> the big man, and David Sonnenberg, they found me when I was like a youth, like barely nineteen. Wow. And so. As a producer, it was like you still struggling, right? You feel me? So, the Fuji's when when the last year of high school and we about to get into this Fuji thing. All I remember was like, yo, we wanted to be a band, and that was the whole thing. We wanted to be a band. We wanted to be a movement. So, record companies, everybody passed on us, right? And the people that signed us was Rough House. Rough House was really an independent, right? Mm -hmm. Moving, and then if you was getting hot on Rough House, then Columbia, of course, automatically picked up and would continue Rough to House work. Rough House based in Philly, right? Thank based you. in Philly with yeah. Chris Schwartz and, and Joe Niccolo. Man, we did this album called Blunted on Reality, right? Mm -hmm. Which was the first Fuji album, right? Mm -hmm. Now, we were signed to a production company called La Jam. People don't even know this story. Like, La Jam, is um, that was like Cool and the Gang's brother. So Cool's brother, Khalees Bayan, is that's the team. The Cool and the Gang is the team that did the first Fuji album mm -hmm. out of Jersey. And this is so important that people understand that in history. So it's like, so the guy who was doing like all of them Cool and the Gangs, the, like one of the geniuses behind it was Khalees Bayan. He was like my mentor. He was one of my mentors and he played all the instruments. So I just was obsessed with him. So we doing this album. Now, when we doing this album, honestly, I could feel a generation gap, right? Because it's almost like you a little kid. They're producing this thing. It's sounding very sophisticated. <laughs> and when you go back to the block, right, it's nothing but a snare, a kick, and a, a bass line, and a vocal, right? So, you know, so... Like, you're a kid, right? So you sitting there, and you know you can hear all this stuff in your head, but you ain't about to challenge no cool in the game. They're like right. 200 million, right? Yeah. So, so you sit there, and um, so with the score, once in a while, they would let me step up, right? So I stepped up. They let me do vocab. So that's why you were reality me. On the, on yeah, I'm blunt in reality. Yeah. That's why vocab sounds different than anything on the album. It's more acoustic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can right. hear like you can you can go on the album. You can see like oh man, the Fuji's is trying to find themselves where they're going. And that's for any artist like Bob Marley and them. If you mm -hmm. listen when they all began, so. Lauren had the solo with Some Seek Star. Yeah, Some Seek Star. Yeah. It was, was a lot of on. got a lot of yelling on that album. It felt <laughs> yeah. So let's go. God damn, damn Elliot. Bath, sorry. The road mic. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so we could talk about the yelling, right? Which was interesting, right? Because keep in mind, we still trying to figure out how we record ourselves. So similar to that that Ray Charles movie when dude was like, "Yo, y'all gotta find y'all tone," right? Mm, yeah. So we had our tone when we p was performing live. So whenever you came to see the Fuji's live, you was like, this ain't what I'm hearing Way on this record. record. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like you're like, this is not what I'm hearing on the record. So that meant, right, that there had to be a producer that came in now mm. to say, okay, you guys can't be yelling like this on this mic because what y'all saying is not translating to the crowd because you don't have to the way that we have in this conversation we can have this mm. Clef you ain't on the block no more you, you're you not battling on this street corner no more you know what I mean like let's get focused and that producer was Salam Remy so Salam <laughs> so Salam came in um, and we uh I always remember he had this this loop and this sample was I think from like a Christmas record and I remember the day we walk in and the sample was like bam, 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 you know and it, it literally looked like a scene from like Beat Street or something you know what I mean you walk in like yo yo you know the Fuji's you know I'm gonna be like yo you know go in the booth and let me hear you spit right so it was dope because I think each of us me and Lauren I think we had to spit at least 15 minutes mm. Prospect, everybody spit. 
And it, while I was spitting, right, I was just freestyling whatever I was doing, like, you know what I mean? Then out of nowhere, it's like, yo, Mona Lisa, can I get a date on Friday, you know? <laughs> and then we do what we do and we leave. Hmm. So Salam is the coach at the time, right? Mm -hmm. His job is he got to take it to the championship. So once again, this is what this is what we was talking about earlier, what, what defines a beat maker from a producer. Yes, sir. So he actually had the vision and took the record and cut it into what you heard, which was nappy wow, heads. Wow, so you didn't lay it down with that, that order. No, yeah. he took the parts and then he created it. So then I was like, blood cleat me start for understand how this business I work you know <laughs> so then so Salam did this he gave me this whole epiphany Nappy Heads remix man so once we so the Nappy Heads remix it made us understand our tone now mm -hmm. it was like yo these are electronics they're mics and when you're expressing yourself you have to do it a certain way you only got three minutes and 20 seconds so your first 20 bars have to be lethal so they pay attention so now we started getting it you know what i mean and that's what led into eventually like what became the score so in the, one in the booger basement i've been there before man the booger basement yeah the book <laughs> the, the booger man the booger freaking basement it goes like way way back you know shout out to the outsiders mm. because at the time it was two movements going on it was like the outsiders on one side. Young Z and them. Yeah. Man, Young Z, Slang Tongue. Eminem was running with them at one yes, time. Yes, Pace One, Eminem. You had like one side then in our side, you know what I mean? So we had like Akon came through. Everyone was coming through. So you can imagine out this energy that's going on in Jersey out of these two forms of basement. Mm -hmm. So me, like I said, in my hood, I was, do I was the Haitian Dr. Dre. <laughs> so I'm like, I got, I know how to work everything. I know how to do my beats. It's gonna cost you, you know what I mean? <laughs> but you I said figured it, it out. But you, you know? said it wasn't like a lot of equipment you was using nah, for the score, we, right? Yeah. To your point, right? So this is how the score was done, right? We couldn't afford equipment. So at the end of the day, everyone will tell you, we had an old raggedy old board, an MCI board, raggedy board had to get fixed a 456 Ampex reel, and a Kai 900, a VFX keyboard, a SP, and an MP. Family, everything you hear on the score, from automation, killing me softly, this is the break stopping, this is, that's me doing everything with my hands. Wow. wow. There's nothing on the score that you hearing that's like, ready or not all of that that's me doing all the 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 normal drops in myself i couldn't afford a fender roads when we was doing killing me softly so what i did was i midied the s900 to my keyboard and i used that oscillator tone that was going boo so i took that tone and i emulated it and i played it back on the midi like it was a, a Fender Rhodes. But when you wow. hear him killing me yeah. softly, that's not a Fender Rhodes. That's why if you try to play with that record, you got to detune your instrument to play with it. Mm. So this is how deep I was when it came to like sonics and the idea of like, you know what I mean, technology. Yeah. Speaking of killing me softly, I remember the original, I think when they sent out the advance, it was more like a dub plate. It was more like about burying the competition with the sound. It wasn't a straight cover. That's right. And I was telling um, the CEO, Madeline Nelson, that. I was like, yo, <laughs> when I first sent out, when we first sent Killing Me Softly, we sent, sent the dub plate version because this another thing about the Fuji's people didn't get. Like, I'm a sound system. So, like, the same way you see, like, Diplo in them, they'll show up and they play Major Laser in them. That's like me. So, like, in Jamaica, like, I'm known for clashes. Mm -hmm. So I'm like a sound refugee sound boy is for real. Like I show up with my dub place <laughs> and murder. Yo, enough money my wife. Say I know I made the original murder a killer. A refuge yo. He's got Kelly so, Rogers yeah. and Whitney Houston yo, dub place. So, huh? so so we did we we didn't know how the game worked in the music business. So we was like, yo, let's cut this as a dub, right? And Lauren cut and who so whoever got the dub plate Send me a copy of oh, that, by that, the way. I got it, I got you got it? it? Yes. You got to send me a oh, copy wow. of it. But it also felt like at the time, once Lauren was getting a buzz, there was there was a lot of written and tried to sort of build a separation within the crew. Like, she was getting a lot of praise, right? Yeah, but, and, one, and, and yeah, I, oh, but to your point, right? So, it's like Matrix. I'm Morpheus. So, <laughs> I'm not worried about what anyone is saying. 
because I've created it, right? I've mm -hmm. created you to talk a certain way. Now, once again, as a producer, you have to make a decision. Laura, um, Lauren Hill, to me, was the LeBron James of the Fugees. So the decision have to be made as a coach, right? I'm the coach. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to create the play. We're going to write the play, but we're going to need the play. So for me, when Lauren was getting all that accolade, I loved it. Like, it's great for me. It meant, like, my group is on the chart. Because understand, for me, as you can see till today, I love being a producer and a writer and writing music for people. That's always my first love. Mm -hmm. And then everything else comes after that. So um, so to your point, we did the Soundboy version. and yeah. Which I thought was sort of like her, her unif like I think in the vocals of a lot of those records, she was expre expressing how much she was connected to the crew and repping for the crew. Like, yeah. you couldn't separate her from you guys. Like, yeah, yeah. She was loyal to what was she was creating with you guys. Yeah. And that was kind of what the song was. Right. Not just a straight Roberta Flack cover, yeah. which, you know. Well, I mean, for yeah. them, yeah, but but it would have been hard to break that up. Like, I found Lauren when she was 14. I had her in the Booger basement recording that. Like, the bond was really real. I mean, I, it was really a real plan. Like, to, to not just say, like, we was putting out a group and it was just a group. You see what I'm saying? You see how certain cliques that got real hot girls in a clique, the girls ain't all over the place. Like, for you to get a feature, it's like you got to go through a whole entire movie. You see what I'm saying to you? <laughs> yeah. Like, that was Lauren. That's like, it wasn't... Was. So, you know, I think a lot of people took a page from, from the Fuji's book. How did y'all get Ross Barak, who is now the mayor of Newark, on the album to do it? Did you know him? Shout out to Ross. Um, he's actually having dinner in my house like months ago. So, Ross was always like the way that he was, man. Like, ever since I met him, he looked... he always talked older than he looked it almost looked like a young dude in a in a in an older man's body it was like is martin luther king in this guy's body or malcolm x like the way he's talking but i got introduced to Raz to actually i met amir his father mm. i met his father because i was a big fan of jazz and i was a jazz major and somebody had me go to his dad's house when i was in high school i don't even think Raz know this and I watched his father do poetry while he had a jazz band in there. And this is in Jersey. That completely like changed my life around completely. Mm -hmm. And then when it was time to do the score, you know, Lauren was like, look, man, Roz can do these, uh, he can be the guy. So once again, me, um, when he came in, um, it was just, once again, I could paint the picture. Mm. So I was like, this is the picture, this is where we're going. And he came in with that voice, you know what I mean? Like, till today. Because um, with the whole score, I wanted every part of it to be for real. So the Chinese store, the different thing, I wanted like, All the you know when you watch the movie it, Friday, yeah. and you could relate it to a neighborhood? So with the score, I wanted it to be like a 360 of like, Brooklyn meets like Jersey, but like the corner store restaurants and, and that whole culture, you know? So was, was was Ready to Not one of the first records where you guys made and you felt like, okay, now we really do have our sound? Like, what were some of the sessions in the score where you felt like, okay, now this is moving in the direction and we kind of feel like we know what we what we are and what we represent? I mean, well, for me, for the, for the, for, for the, the Fugees, it was sort of like what, what Will I Am was for the Black Eyed Peas. So my job was just, I would stay there 24 seven, just cooking, you know? So ready or not, it came from a movie Sleepwalker. And I heard the sample, next day I sampled it on the drums. Um, and I'll never forget, I was in a little room upstairs from the booger and Lauren walked in and she heard the beat. And then she started just singing like, ready or not, here I come, just mad different things on it. And the one that stuck was like, uh, ready or not. And that's sort of like how it came. But in my brain, as a producer, like, I can already hear. Once I, I saw what Salam was doing, like, I already knew. Like, Salam was one of probably my greatest inspirations. Because once I saw Salam, I was like, I figured this out. I'm going to combine live instrumentation with the SP and the MP. And then we got to keep it clean. There ain't going to be no yelling. So Salam gave me that tutorial on where we was going. Now, I didn't think that album was going to sell as much as it did. Like, we thought maybe, like, we, we thought figure, we figured, like, maybe we'll go gold on that, on this next one. You know what I mean? 
Yeah. Wow. But worldwide, that was, I remember also that was one of the first albums. Be that they were talking about like it not just being successful in America, but the impact so fast worldwide. Like mm-hmm. we sold a million in this country, sold a million in that country. Like it but, spread in a different. But I was wanting to know was it met with resistance because like you have Fuji Lots, the Tina Marie cover, kind of you know mm-hmm. Roberta Flack killing me softly, Enya already did not. Even though this was your sophomore album, it was kind of like your first look. Was were you was it hard like to clear those samples with those guys or anything like that? No, I mean that's definitely a good question. Um, well, Fuji La, the original beat, Salam did that beat Fuji La, and till today, every time I see Fat Joe, he'd be like, "Y'all stole my beat." <laughs> oh, that was Joe's. So beat. the beat was originally done. <laughs> oh, yeah, Salam did. <laughs> yeah, I heard about that. It was Fat Joe's beat. So the yeah. Fuji La beat. Did he lay a vocal for The me? Fuji La beat was done from all the way up. That's my man, right? So it was done <laughs> for Fat Joe, and. Um, but you know how so as a producer you have beats sitting around and and so we came in and um and we laced that but no because it was sort of like when people heard what we were doing they didn't see like we was just sampling there was like homies really getting creative with our music Mm -hmm. and he's respecting it so it wasn't like i was just sampling something and it was no it was like roberta flack when we was doing that was for real like lauren really did like 10,000 vocal takes. I watched her do it. She was obsessed by this song. She's like, this is the song. It has to come out a certain way, you know? Mm. And what about Red Alert? What was Whose idea was to put him on the, like to narrate the album? I mean, you can go back to with me and Red Alert, like, you know, like, once again, like, I'm from the era of the culture. Like, you know what I mean? So for me, um, Red Alert would stamp that 360 sound. Because you see, people was running with hype. And the Fuji's always ran against hype. Because we was doing music in an album when you listen to the score, you don't know who 80% of the MCs are on there. Worldwide, like, you wouldn't know. Like, Cowboys and those kind of records. Know. Yeah, yeah. because it was always about the talent first and then everything else. So for us, Red Alert, like, it was like getting cool hurt. You know what I'm saying? Like, he's <laughs> solidified. There's no way you're going to do something called a score. It's going to be iconic. And you don't hear, like, Red Alert's voice. You know what I mean? It, mm. would, it wouldn't it would be just. 